Good morning. It's good to be with you again. I would invite you to open with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll begin there uh, in just a minute. Uh, Oops. As we begin, though, I do want to kind of share a little bit of the background as far as uh, where this study has come from. A few years ago, I was thinking about the concept that you find there in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, walking by faith, we walk by faith and not by sight. And I got to think about that, and what does that really mean? And practically, what is that going to look like in the life of a Christian? And so I just kind of chewed on that for a while and was kind of trying to process that thought in my mind and to dwell on that over a period of several months, and and I had an opportunity to to teach a class on the book of Hebrews, and I kind of stepped back from the 11th chapter, obviously that's that chapter of faith, and I decided to to step back from that and think about what is this teaching us about faith in general, and I think that gives us a picture of what walking by faith really is going to look like as far as uh, the practical uh, application of that to our lives. And so I want to think about that for just a few minutes this morning. Faith, as far as how it impacts our life and how it's going to be seen in the life that we live. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, obviously Paul says, we walk by faith and not by sight. I want to begin just by asking, what do you think it means to walk by faith? Sure, absolutely. I think, obviously, that concept of walking is a common metaphor in the Bible, uh, meaning our conduct, our manner of life. And so, you're you're looking at it from the basis of faith. And I want to think about the, before we move on to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we'll get to there in just a minute, I just want to think about that within the context of what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. If you back up a chapter, or 2 Corinthians 5, if you back up a chapter, the fourth chapter, uh, what Paul is doing is describing himself or the, the apostles as they spread the gospel and the kind of suffering that they're enduring as children of, uh, as apostles of Christ. He says in verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not uh, destroyed always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. And he continues into verse 16 saying, We do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction, and that's a bit of a perspective for us there, momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so Paul says, you know, we, we're suffering as children of God, or as apostles of Christ, as we're taking this message to the world around us. He says, we are suffering, but that's okay, because we're looking forward to that eternal weight of glory. It's preparing us for that eternal uh, weight of glory. And he continues into the next chapter, chapter 5, as he picks up that thought of the earthly tent. This earthly tent is going to be destroyed, but he says we're going to then put on an eternal dwelling, which is far greater. And so, in verse 6, then, Paul says, Therefore, always being of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, and as a parenthetical statement, he kind of adds in that, for we walk by faith, not by sight, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. And so what I see Paul saying here is essentially, we're going to be bold, and we're going to be courageous, and we're going to continue to proclaim the gospel, 
knowing that they're still going to persecute us and maybe even put us to death for it because we're walking by faith. And we're thinking about the greater spiritual reality that exists beyond simply this life. They can take my life, but there's something better waiting for me if they do that. And so, with that thought, I want to look at the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And to, before we get into the 11th chapter there, I want to look at how it's set up here in, in the 10th chapter. As I've studied throughout the book of Hebrews, you find the first 10 chapters or so, about 10 and a half chapters, you might say, uh, or nine and a half, have a focus of kind of just a doctrinal discussion where he's trying to emphasize who Jesus is here and to remind them that if you just knew who this Jesus was, you'd never walk away from, from him. And then there's a, I see a bit of a transition about verse 19 of chapter 10 where he's now encouraging them, okay, this is Jesus, now just take advantage of that. Take advantage of what he's done for you. And so we find a bit of warning there in verse 26 and following, and then he continues them or continues on to encourage them in verse 35 uh, to not cast away their confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Uh, but we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but that of, of those who have faith to the saving of the soul. You kind of see some of the similarities there between what Paul say, or the author here says in Hebrews chapter 10 with what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, with the concept of walking by faith, the author of Hebrews is encouraging them, press on and keep going because the reward is going to be great. It's that same kind of concept. You're suffering, but just endure a little while, and you will receive the promise. It has great reward, he says there in verse 35. All right, so, again, I don't know, I'm not going to necessarily look at all of the examples of faith here in the 11th chapter of of Hebrews, but there's four things, and I don't know if we'll get to all of them today, uh, but we will, uh, what time are we? Okay, Uh, we will um, get as far as we can and and see what we can, we do there. The four things that I think you see from the 11th chapter of Hebrews that it teaches us about faith, number one is it teaches us that faith is a matter of trust, uh, complete and total trust, it's a matter of hope, and it's a matter of action and endurance. And I think those four things are crucial to a faith, to the saving of the soul, and really what the essence of walking by faith is going to look like. And so, we'll begin with the concept of faith trusting. What is trust? In the context of faith. Sure. So a confidence, right? Can you think of how we see trust in the examples in the eleventh chapter here? What what examples do we have of, of folks who have trusted in God? Mm-hmm. And they hadn't so much as seen rain at that point. And yet God says, I'm going to destroy the world by flood and you build a boat. And I don't know about y'all, but I can imagine the kind of looks that Noah is going to be getting as he's building this big boat. And people are thinking, what in the world is this guy doing? Noah is an example of, of trust. What about Abraham? How does Abraham demonstrate trust in God? 
Yeah. And that's kind of hard for us to fathom, I think, because all we just do is pop up our phone and look up our Maps app, and we can just see wherever we want to go. I mean, it's real simple there. Uh, but obviously, Abraham didn't have that. God says, I'm going to show you where you're going. Just leave, and I'm going to show you where you're going. That's a great deal of trust. And I think you see that concept throughout the remainder of this chapter with all these examples. And so what I want to notice as far as the trust is concerned, uh, you see that with Noah. God says, I'm going to destroy the world. If you build this ark, I'm going to save you and whoever you can get to get on the ark with you. Uh, He tells Abraham, leave your homeland and I'm going to give you this nation, obviously to your descendants, but... What Noah and Abraham and many of the others that are listed here have, they have nothing but the promises of God to rest upon. Abraham never saw the promised land. Well, I mean, he saw the promised land, but he never saw the fulfillment of the promise. And they had nothing but the promise of God to rest upon, and yet they regulated their entire lives in light of those promises. Their entire life was changed simply because a promise was made to them by God. And their faith consisted in taking God at His word. And so, faith involves more than simply just a belief in God, but it's a believing of God. I think that's the essence there in verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You have the the common basic foundational understanding that most people have of faith, and that is a belief, which is certainly a part of it. I think it's the very bottom part of it. But it also indicates a, a trust. I believe in him and I trust that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And you see that with all these examples, how they believed in the promise of God so much so that they did what God says and they were blessed as a result of that. So, obviously, that kind of trust is something that we need to develop. And are we just blind in our trust of God? Are we just blindly trusting Him and hoping that it's all going to work out? Hopefully not, right? In Deuteronomy 7, we have reason to trust in God because He's proven Himself to be trustworthy, right? Deuteronomy chapter 7 and in verse 9. It says, know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and His loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love Him and keep His commandments. What does that tell us about God? He is faithful. He is faithful. When God says something, it is a trustworthy statement. When God makes a promise, it's something that you can trust in. You know, we have to worry about men, right? I remember my dad telling me about, you know, he remembers a time when you could make even some serious transactions with a simple handshake. And now you have to have pages of documents that you sign, contracts, to obligate you legally to do what you say you're going to do because people aren't faithful anymore. And so we tend to become a little bit jaded, right? And we're not very trusting of anybody anymore. But we can trust God. And we ought to trust God. We ought to develop that kind of trust because He's proven Himself to be faithful. And that's what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. Again, that God is faithful who has called us into uh, fellowship. 
Another reason why we can trust God, why our faith would not be blind, is because God always keeps His promises. And going back to the uh, sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews, oh, it usually helps if you turn this on. Uh, the sixth chapter of Hebrews, we find that discussion about the promises of God. And, and he describes the promise made to Abraham, how God told Abraham that he would bless him and multiply him. And it says, when he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. And he says there in verse 17, in the same way, God desiring to show even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge who would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. The unchangeableness of his purpose. What does that tell us about God? He's constant. He's constant. And I think we, we have a bit of anxiety as far as people are concerned sometimes, right? Because you never know how, much, how consistent they're going to be or how much they're going to... They'll be one way today and then another way tomorrow and then another way the next day. And kind of sometimes people change so much it kind of makes your head spin. But God, it says, the unchangeableness of His purpose... We can trust Him because He is faithful. And when He makes a promise, He will keep it. He is faithful and He's worthy of our trust. And so, I do want to think about, in light of trusting in God, I see a tremendous example here with Abraham in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, beginning in verse 17, where Abraham offers up Isaac. And what I find interesting about this particular chapter, or this particular section, is it says that Abraham was tested offering up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, and Isaac your descendant shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a tithe. So what I find interesting about Abraham here is you've got God making a promise to Abraham here, and the promise would be fulfilled in Isaac, and then Isaac is brought along, and now God says, all right, I want you to offer him on the altar. And so here's Abraham and Isaac, and the fulfillment of the promise is yet to come, and in between that, God is saying, I want you to offer up your son, and and. I don't know about you, but I would just be sitting there thinking, how are we going to get there? If I do this, how are we going to get there? Right? But, but Abraham, he maintains his confidence that if I offer up Isaac, somehow, some way, God's still going to get me here. God's still going to get me to the promise, the fulfillment of the promise. And so he's willing to sacrifice Isaac, knowing, I don't know how he's going to do it. He could raise him right back up from the dead. He's that powerful. But somehow, some way, we're going to get there. Abraham trusted that completely. And so we need to develop that very same kind of, of trust in God, where we take God at his word, where we rely deeply upon the promises of God. I don't need to know all the answers. I just simply trust the one who does have the answers. And so, true faith is not going to be trusting that it's all going to work out, but rather I'm going to trust even when it does not work out the way that I think or want it to work out. There's going to be things that happen in our lives that make us wonder why, that, think, that don't make sense. And we need to reach a point where understanding, we don't need to understand all the details. I think that's part of our human nature. I just want to, to know every little thing, and that, that gives me confidence and assurance and comfort. Uh, 
What about just taking comfort in the fact that God has it in His control and He is faithful and I'm just going to trust Him. I'm just going to rely on Him because He's got it figured out. And He's going to lead me where I need to go. And so the answer, I think, is to develop a deep and abiding trust in God. God will never let you down and God will never disappoint you. And so trust in Him. All right, any other questions or thoughts on trust there before we move on? If not, I want to look at faith and hope. And I want to expand a little bit upon some of what we mentioned last night as far as the hope of something better as far as this life is concerned. Uh, Faith and hope are things that are intimately related. You see those two passages there, Galatians 5 and verse 5 and 1 Peter 1 and verse 21. Uh, Both of those will connect faith and hope. And I think... I don't tend to hear as much about hope as perhaps we should consider hope. Hope is a vital part of our faith in Christ, faith in God. Hope is vital to being, having the kind of faith that we need to have. And the reality is we hope for things that we do not yet have or experience, right? I hope for a new house or a new car, or I hope for uh, my team to win the championship, whatever it might be. But if they've done it, and I'm not hoping for it, I have it, right? And so when we believe in that for which we hope, and we're confident of it as if we've already obtained it, then we have true biblical faith. And so I think that's what you see with the patriarchs here in the the 11th chapter of Hebrews, they were so confident in what God was giving them and they hoped for it and they had such confidence in that hope that it's as if they had already been given what God had promised them and they lived in light of that. What I think that's going to show us then is that faith by its very nature is going to be forward-looking, right? Faith is going to look ahead of us Not necessarily to what's ahead of us in this life, but what's ahead beyond this life, right? And so, we don't have a whole lot of time to to really dive into this, but what I think is interesting is you have a parallel to what we've read there in chapter 10, the end of chapter 10, in the sixth chapter. And what you you see as you study the book of Hebrews is the author is going to pick up concepts and then kind of leave it for a moment, and then he's going to bring it back up and expand on it later on. And I think in the sixth chapter, he kind of does expand or introduce this concept before really diving into it in fuller depth in the 10th and 11th chapters. And so in in the sixth chapter, and I think it starts back in the end of 5, where in verse 11 he says, I'm trying to tell you about the priesthood of Jesus, and it's hard to explain because you're dull of hearing, and you need to be growing, and you haven't been growing as you ought to, and you need to pursue perfection. And then he gives one of the, the strongest warnings there in verses six through seven, or six, four through six, as far as the, um, those who fall away. And, and in verse nine, he encourages them, you know, this is a warning. You need to be careful that you don't reach this point, and I'm, I think better of y'all. We are convinced of better things concerning you. I don't think that, can, that describes you, is what he's saying here. And so, he says in verse 10, God's not unjust to forget your work and love which you have shown toward His name, and having ministered and in minist- still ministering to the saints. And then we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to receive the full assurance of hope until the end. Does that not sound familiar to what we read there in chapter 10 and verse 35? You have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. So you show diligence to receive the full assurance of hope until the end. Verse 12, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Who are those who faith and patience inherited the promises? Well, let me show you a list of these folks in Hebrews chapter 11. 
And so I think it, it kind of just outlines what the 10th and 11th chapter of Hebrews is going to tell us later on. And emphasizes the fact that you're suffering, you're enduring these hardships, and the way you get through that is hope. And I, I hate to... I hate to kind of use this example because I don't want to trivialize uh, the nature of our hope. Uh, but you think about that, that carrot on a stick that you hold out in front of somebody or whatever, like a piece of meat or something that you're holding out, and then the person is going to run for it, and then they'll never catch it because it's always right there in front of them. Heaven is set before us. Eternity is set before us. And we need to look to that constantly. Look forward to the reward to keep us going in this life. And so, we mentioned last evening, Hebrews 11, verse 13 through 16, where you have these uh, patriarchs dying in faith. And they died in faith because they lived in faith. And they had not received the promise, but they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and exiles because they desired a better, that is, a heavenly country. And so God was not ashamed to be called their God, for He had prepared a city for them. You know, in light of that, I think of what Jesus says in John 8 and verse 56, before Abraham, or Abraham rejoiced to see my day, he saw it and was glad. How did Abraham see Christ's day? See Christ. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the three promises that were made to Abraham find their fulfillment, their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. And Abraham, I think Abraham recognizes that yes, there is a physical fulfillment, and his descendants, particularly the sons of Jacob, would receive, to a large extent, the fulfillment of those promises. But I think there was a recognition, and the, Hebrew, the book, 11th chapter of Hebrews, I think, indicates to us that there was a recognition on their part of the fact that there was a greater fulfillment yet to come. And so that's why it says Abraham is not looking forward to living in the promised land. He was looking forward to the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Why? Because he had hope. He lived with hope of what God had promised. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you think about Moses later on. You think about where Moses was. From our perspective, we might think, you know, Moses had it made, right? Moses was set. You know, he's royalty. He's living in the palace. He's got, he, that's the life, man. I mean, that's what you want. That's what you're dreaming of. And yet, in verse 24, Moses, when he had grown, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure, I lost my place, to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing, passing pleasures of sin. I don't know about y'all, but you, you kind of read that, and for a moment you're just kind of thinking, what are you doing, Moses? Why would you give all that up? Well, the next verse gives us the answer. Choosing rather, or Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. That's hope. Why did Moses abandon his life in Egypt so he could suffer with God's people? Because he had hope of something greater. 
He had hope of a greater reality that God was bringing about in Christ. And do we not have reason to live our lives with the very same hope? I realize the fulfillment in Christ has been brought about, but they, there still is hope of eternal life that awaits us, is there not? Is that not what Peter describes in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, when he talks about this inheritance that God has promised us? We've been begotten again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have reason to live with that same hope. And I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I do know who holds tomorrow, and that should be enough for me. And we need to remember that this world is not our home. God has given us this world to enjoy while we are here. But this is not our true home. Our true home awaits us after this life is over. We are seeking a greater homeland. We are seeking an eternal homeland, right? And the perspective that I think we ought to live with is even if this world completely falls apart around us, kind of like it feels like it's doing right now, right? Does it kind of not feel like everything's just going sour and, and just the world's just completely looking like it's falling apart around us? What if some catastrophe comes upon us? I don't know, maybe just something just drops right on this building and we're all toast. Can we not be at peace? Could we not live at peace knowing that there's a home waiting for us? I think based upon the frailty of our human condition, we are conditioned to think as if death is the very worst thing that can happen to us. But the reality is, for the faithful child of God, death is the very best thing that could happen to us. Why? Because we get to go home and be with our Lord. And that takes us back to what Paul says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, we are preaching the gospel. We are being courageous even though they persecute us. We're going to continue being bold because we know that if they take our life, that's the very best thing that they could do to us because we get to go home and put on the eternal dwelling. and We get to be with the Lord. And so I think the problem is, and, and I think that's just part of our human nature, is we get so caught up in this life and trying to make it the very best that we can and trying to hold it so dear to us that we're going to try, and to pre try to preserve it at all costs. When the reality is, this is not what we're living for. If it is, then you know that's... That's pretty disappointing, right? If the greatest thing we have to look forward to is a life of sickness and, and pain and, and suffering and hardship, that's pretty sorry, right? But we have a greater home where there is no sickness, there is no sorrow, there is no dying. We get to dwell in the presence of our Lord forever and ever and ever. Hope needs to be a part of our life. We need to live with that kind of hope that we are looking forward to the eternal home that God has promised and let that dictate our lives. Let that transform your life so that you can walk by faith and not by sight. All right, any other thoughts on hope before we move on? I spent a little more time on those two because I think those are kind of the, 
ones that we're less familiar with. The, the next one is one that I think we all know, and that is faith is going to move us to action. Mark chapter 2 is the story where this paralyzed man was brought to Jesus, and they can't fit him into the, the house because there's a great crowd. And so they open up a hole in the roof and they lower him down before the Lord. And it says there in verse 5 of Mark chapter 2, when Jesus saw their faith, what did Jesus see? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It wasn't a neon sign that said faith and pointing to them. Faith, faith. Hey, these people have faith. And it's not that big phylactery full of tons of Scripture on their forehead. Jesus saw what their faith moved them to do. And that's what James describes in James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. And so if we want to have a living faith, it's coupled with action, coupled with faithfulness, with obedience. And the 11th chapter of Hebrews is filled with examples of people who did just that. They trusted in the promises of God. They were filled with hope to the point that they acted on that trust and hope in order to live their lives in a way that was pleasing in the sight of God. And so... I think we all understand that part. But what I want to emphasize is the matter of perspective. We know that we need to do what God told us to do. The New Testament is abundantly clear on that. I think it's chock full of that kind of stuff. But the question is why? Why are we doing what we are doing? You think about a little boy, mom tells him, I want you to clean your room. And he's going to clean his room, but is he happy about it? Not really, because he'd rather be playing, right? Do we treat the commands of God that way sometimes? How do we get to the point where doing what God wants us to do is a joy to us? Let me illustrate it this way. A little boy with his dad, they're walking down the road, and it's just hot outside. And, and his dad, they stop at an ice cream shop, and the dad gives him some money and says, go in there and get you an ice cream cone. And he grabs that dollar and joyfully runs in there and gets his ice cream cone. And there's a couple of older ladies sitting there watching and talking about what an obedient boy that is. And then later on at home, he tells him to clean his room, and he starts throwing a fit and crying. I don't want to clean my room. What was it about the first thing that caused him to do it with joy? It's what he wanted, right? It's what he wanted. He loved ice cream, and he was glad to do that because he got what he wanted. And I think part of this is to change our perspective so that we are doing the will of God or we make God's will our will. And that's part of the self-denial that you find in in Matthew 16 where it's denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following Jesus. We're setting our will aside so that we can do the will of God. And it's not just that I'm doing this because God said so, but I'm doing this because I love God, and I want to please Him in all that I do. That's a much more fulfilling perspective, isn't it? It's not just, well, I have to do this, but rather, I get to serve God. I think you can see that in a marriage relationship, right? You serve one another, and it's not a a grudging task. It's joyfully serving one another. And I think that's a perspective we ought to have as we 
faithfully serve God. Our faith and trust, our trust and hope are so great that we can't bring ourselves to do anything but the will of God because we're so anticipating the promises that God has made. And then really quickly, we'll move into the the last part here. Hebrews chapter 10, we read this a few moments ago. He encourages them to endure. You have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you can receive what was promised. And of course, he quotes from the Old Testament here, encourages them to endure so that they can receive the promises of God. And he shows some examples in the 11th chapter of people who did that, those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then he bookends it in chapter 12 and verse 1. We have this great cloud of witnesses which surrounds us. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So these examples, of, these examples of faith are bookended with the concept of endurance. They endured in order to receive the promise, and you can too. You can too. And so despite the trials that we're going to face, faith will continue to press on. You cannot stop me from pressing on when my hope of eternal life is great. You know, think about this for a, for a moment. For those of you that are parents, you'll probably understand this one really well. Let's say that your child is diagnosed with some serious, serious condition, and you have to, you have to work hard for a great number of days, a great period of time, in order to be able to save their life. And maybe you're about halfway through and you're just drained. Are you going to give up? No. Why? Because you love your child and you do anything to save their life. When we love God that much, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up because I want to go be with my Lord. And so we need to have that same perspective of Paul. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, being faithful until death. And so what I want us to see is that true faith is going to result in a transformed life. Faith, because our trust is so great, because we have such a deep hope, it's going to move us to action to the point that we're never going to quit. Why? Because we have such a great trust and hope in the Lord. And so, I'll leave you with this final question. How much is your faith affecting your life? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.